Okay, everyone. Well, we're trying to solve that. I'm going to start us off here. My name is Isabel Bjork, and I'm the executive director of the Genomics Institute. Um, I'm sorry that you missed Rafe's introduction because George and Rafe have been absolutely incredible for supporting these crawl lectures. Um, it's given an opportunity to many researchers to profile their research, and it's been incredibly important. So um, I want to give them a special thanks to for their support of pediatric genomics in particular and an opportunity for us to speak tonight. I'm going to do one check before I continue to see if Rafe's volume is working yet. All right, so it sounds like no, it sounds like we haven't managed to get the volume to work. Um, and so um, I will start um, just um, telling you a little bit about why these crawl lectures matter to me. So, and why this particular one matters so much. Um, and again, many thanks to Rafe and to George for sponsoring this. Um, tonight, we're talking about two things that are really dear to my heart and to the heart of many of us here at UCSC, which is the combination of the COVID testing work that we we have been doing since May 1st and really what that has meant for developing a diagnostic capacity at UCSC. Now, um, that is the, it started with the Molecular Diagnostic Lab for COVID, which is now the Collagen Clinical Diagnostic Lab. Um, that lab will eventually um, work on diagnostic testing for pediatrics. And so that is why we're here tonight to talk about what the future can hold and what the present has made possible for the future here in pediatrics. Um, I do want everybody to know we missed the housekeeping issues um, from Rafe. You couldn't hear those. We usually do a question and answer for 30 minutes after a craw presentation. This time we're not going to do that. We're going to have a discussion panel. So we have questions for our panelists. And in those questions, you are more than welcome to submit your own questions. So please do do that. Um, we will weave them into our communications and that will be um, that will be really important to us to be able to reach out to you and do that. Um, also, please know that um, this is being recorded and that we will disseminate the recording after the crawl lecture. So if you know people that wanted to be here but did not have a chance to see this or you want to share it, you will have an opportunity to do that. Um, okay, so what I wanted to, to say is um, one of the reasons that I'm here speaking tonight, and I think one of the things that Rafe was going to tell you about me is that I started at UCSC five years ago in pediatric genomics and worked to help build the team that is now the Treehouse Childhood Cancer Initiative. Um, that initiative was founded by Elena Vasky, who is here tonight. Um, it is also true that Elena uh, was instrumental in the founding of the Molecular Diagnostic Lab here on campus. And that is the lab that does COVID-19 testing now. Um, so one of the key reasons that we were able to start a COVID testing facility on this campus was that Elena did her fellowship at UCSF. And uh, after her postdoc here at the UC Santa Cruz Genomics Institute. So she did her postdoc with David Hausler, um, who also co-founded the Treehouse Childhood Cancer Initiative. That fellowship resulted in a certification known as the Clinical Genetic Molecular Biologist Scientist Certificate. Um, the name isn't important, but what is important about it is that it gave Elena, who was a relatively newly hired assistant professor at UCSC, the authority to perform specialized molecular biology diagnostic tests. 
And at the time, what that meant was she was the only person, the only faculty member on our campus who could do diagnostic testing. And it so happened that exactly around the time, um, maybe not exactly, but shortly after she started, um, and uh, COVID became uh, an international pandemic, the governor of the state of California issued an executive order that allowed persons with a specialized license to operate more broadly as what's called a clinical scientist um, in the lab and only those people can report on diagnostic testing for COVID-19. So Elena was unique um, here on the faculty in that her license allowed her to report these diagnostic tests and that in turn allowed us to start a COVID-19 lab. Um, that was incredibly important and UCSC is committed um, in an extraordinary way to COVID testing for the community and for the campus. But it also meant that those of us who worked on the Treehouse Childhood Cancer Initiative and who really shared this dream of bringing diagnostic testing to pediatrics had an opportunity to do that suddenly. It seemed impossible at the beginning because we didn't have a medical school. We didn't know how to run diagnostic testing. There are many privacy issues for patients. We learned all of that in COVID testing and um, the extraordinary experience that we've gained in developing and running the lab is what will make diagnostic testing in pediatrics possible very soon at UCSC. So our goal tonight is to tell you about what the lab can accomplish, why it's game changing for pediatrics, and why there will be breakthroughs in pediatric cancer treatment as a result of what we can do in diagnostic testing. Um, but we couldn't do that without collaborations with hospitals because at the end of the day, we are not a medical school. And so um, we have on the panel today, Dr. Sherry Spunt, who's collaborated with UCSC for over five years now. She's been an extraordinary partner and um, she is not only a tr incredible human being, which she's demonstrated over and over again as part of um, our collaboration uh, when we see her, all, we see her very, very often over the last five years. Um, but she works with children with rare sarcomas and children who face dire prognoses, often resulting in long, painful treatments and sadly, sometimes death. And so for Sherry, this is, um, and for all of us, but I see it on her face often, um, this is incredibly important moving work and it is work that needs more answers than currently exist. So Sherry is also an endowed professor of pediatric cancer at Stanford University. She's affiliated with Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford. Um, again, she's committed to solving challenges faced by children, adolescents, and young adults with soft tissue sarcomas. And she has an interest in developmental therapeutics and the late effects of cancer therapy. I'm really, really grateful to um, Sherry for being here and for being a partner with us through all of this. Finally, on this panel, we have Yvonne Vasquez, who's a graduate student in molecular cell and Deve developmental biology department at UC Santa Cruz, and specifically in Elena's lab. Um, Yvonne has been with Treehouse for quite a while now because she started as an undergraduate, then she became a staff member. Now she's a graduate researcher. She'll tell all of you more about how she got here and her story, but I did want to share that Yvonne really has been absolutely incredible all the way through. And um, not only because she's a very intelligent woman who is dedicated to her work, but also because of her passion for pediatric genomics. It's a pleasure to have her here tonight. And with that, I would like to begin. Um, I am getting a lot of notes about sound. So can somebody please send me a note and tell me what you're hearing? All right, with that, I will assume that people can hear us. Um, Elena, can you start by telling us why you became a pediatric cancer researcher? 
and what inspired you down this path, please? Absolutely. Um, I'm very happy to be here and thank you very much for that generous introduction, Isabel. And thank you to the panelists for being here as well. Um, I started in pediatric cancer a long time ago uh, during my undergraduate studies and I did that at the University of Toronto. So I came here from, from Canada. Um, I actually happened to get a summer job in a, a pediatric cancer lab studying uh, a pediatric cancer called neuroblastoma. And it happened to be that my position in that lab, it was a summer undergraduate experience type position was funded by uh, the family of a little boy called James Burrell, who uh, died of neuroblastoma. And so I was a, a young student at the time and I was very inspired by the story of this family. You know, they're, they're, they lost their boy, but then they set up this summer um, student program to, um, uh, to help advance research into neuroblastoma so that other kids have a better outcome uh, for this disease. And so then was when I realized that pediatric cancers or a lot of pediatric cancers are actually uh, not curable. Uh, you know, there, there has been a lot of medical progress as uh, Dr. Spont, uh, Sherry will probably mention, but uh, there is still a lot of um, great clinical challenges in the field, especially for patients with solid tumors and tumors that come back after treatment. And so I just back then made this decision to stay in this field and, you know, see if I can help advance the field forward. And of course, being young, you know, I had this dream to cure neuroblastoma during my PhD, <laughs> my undergraduate program. And then later I did a PhD focusing also on neuroblastoma genomics. And of course, as a result of that PhD, there were just more questions. Um, more questions because we understood that neuroblastoma was heterogeneous and there were genetic complexities in this disease. It was not very simple. And so then I came to Santa Cruz to um, learn sophisticated bioinformatics and genomics approaches from David Hausler, who is really, uh, who is really the best in this field in, in the field of large genomics. And so, uh, so here we are. So I, I just wanted to say that my being in this field is really uh, due to philanthropists and due to foundations and families that put in money into this field and put in their dedication and passion. And they in turn inspired me to dedicate my career to this field. And so um, that's why I think events like these are, are really important. They really matter. Thank you, Elena. Sherry, I have a similar question for you. Can you tell us about what inspired you to become a pediatric oncologist and maybe some about the people that you serve, the numbers of kids that you see and the kinds of diseases that you specialize in and you know, sort of what give the audience a sense of your day-to-day -day life? Sure, so my journey into pediatric oncology actually started many years ago, actually, I, my first memory of understanding anything about cancer came from a book I read in high school called Death Be Not Proud, which was a memoir written by the father of a child who died of a brain tumor. And I was so moved by that, that I always remembered that as I uh, made my journey into medicine. And um, I became a pediatrician because I love working with children and I love working with um, parents who are doing their best for their child and, and really enjoyed being part of that team um, that, <clears throat> that focuses around um, the, the benefit of the child. So um, as I entered this field, um, I recognized that I, I needed to find my academic niche and one, uh, one doesn't always choose uh, one's journey. Sometimes one's journey chooses you. And uh, for me, I, I remember as a fellow, and I trained at a good program, but I had two patients um, who both had very rare sarcomas that nobody really fully understood. And they both had what seemed to me to be very similar diseases. 
And uh, one attending physician said, we're just going to do surgery alone on this patient. And the other patient got chemotherapy and radiation and very intensive interventions. And it, it struck me that it wasn't really clear why these two children were different. And I wondered if my attending physicians knew what they were doing, uh, to be completely honest. And that stayed with me. And when I became a junior faculty member, uh, when I went into oncology, I was trying to find my place. And my mentor wanted to keep me out of his academic area. And he said, why don't you try to make some sense of these rare sarcomas. So I spent the first decade of my career sort of trying to make sense of these patients and, um, and tried to figure out how to categorize them into groups so that we could decide which patients needed treatment and which patients didn't and what kind of treatment they should do. And that effort led eventually to a clinical trial that was conducted through the Children's Oncology Group which is a consortium that treats patients all around um, the country with cancer. And uh, that 20 plus year effort <laughs> eventually led to a, a system to stratify patients into different treatment groups and to try to optimize the standard therapy that we have. But I recognize along this journey that the therapy that we have to offer these patients is really not ideal. It causes a lot of long-term side effects. It causes a lot of acute side effects. We, we have patients who die of infections from time to time. These patients are left with a lot of burden from their treatment. And so I became very interested in how can we do better? And so I think through um, the years I've tried, uh, I've, I've worked on different new drugs to see, you know, which drugs can be added to the therapy for these patients. And in recent years with the genomic revolution, I've become engaged in this team at UC Santa Cruz that's doing this really cutting edge genomics work. And what I love about this team is that um, they were sort of in search of a clinician, I was in search of a team that was really committed to figuring out how to make progress for these kids. Um, because I'm the one who sits in front of the patient, but, um, but having a team behind me that sort of cares and is willing to help me navigate how to make sense of these patients has been um, really refreshing and, and, and useful. So, um, I know that we'll talk a little bit more about this partnership and, and what we, the work we do together. Um, but um, that for me has been uh, something that sustains me as I see these patients who um, many times um, don't do well and for whom I continue to hope that we can find better therapies for. Um, so my practice is uh, really about half of my time I spend seeing patients and the other half of my time, uh, I devote to academic pursuits, trying to push things forward, trying to uh, take exciting new developments uh, from the laboratory and bring them to the patients. And um, we'll talk more about this particular initiative, uh, I think, as we go on. But, um, but that's what motivates me and drives me because I, as I look into the faces of these patients and families where I can't affect a cure. I have to believe that the efforts that we're making to make advances and bring better therapies to them are going to pay off someday. And so that's, that's kind of a sustained thing. Thank you, Sherry. Um, I realized as you were speaking that some people in the audience may not know what sarcomas are. I was wondering if you could just give a moment to tell everybody. Sure. So, um, Obviously, there are many kinds of cancer that occur in children. In general, we divide them into two groups, uh, liquid tumors and solid tumors, for simplicity's sake. So liquid tumors being leukemia and lymphoma, things that uh, people have often heard of. The other group is the solid tumors. And in that solid tumor group, there are some big categories, brain tumors, sarcomas, which are tumors of, of the supporting structures of the body. They arise from cells that become bone and muscle and joints and all of those sorts of tissues. 
And then there are a number of other kinds of childhood cancers like neuroblastoma that are more developmental uh, cancers that occur strictly in children, but, um, but occur as a result of abnormal tissue development as, as uh, children are growing. Thanks, that's very helpful. So, um, sarcomas do occur in adults as well, but uh, they're considerably more common in, in kids as a, as a percentage of cancers. Thank you. So, Elena, I'm wondering if you can give a background into um, the kind of work that you do. And specifically, you referred to comparative genomics just briefly, uh, if you can talk about what that is and help everybody understand how that connects with what is going on in the clinic as well. Yes. Uh, so Sherry already alluded to this very important point that pediatric cancers are quite different from adult cancers. Uh, you know, they're different in, in many ways. Uh, clinically, a lot of them are very aggressive. They also, a lot of them respond better to chemo, at least initially, because they're aggressive. Um, at the molecular level, um, pediatric cancers often have much fewer mutations, or we call them spelling mistakes in the DNA, compared to adult cancers. And that, and that makes sense if we you know, postulate that mu mutations accumulate uh, throughout our lifetime. And so as we age, we get more mutations because we're exposed to more things. Uh, environmental things like UV light or smoking or you know what have you that contributes to muta mutations uh, while children get this very early and so they would not have had a chance to experience those environmental effects to the same degree and so there are fewer mutations in, in kids than adults um, and that's kind of our whole work is based on addressing that fact or you know, seeing how we can leverage, uh, leverage that fact about pediatric cancers and develop approaches that would be specific to pediatric cancer patients. And wh why are mutations important in general? Well, a lot of um, these new developments in, in cancer treatment that are called targeted therapies actually target specific mutations that occur in cancer cells. And so by that mechanism, we can specifically target cancer cells while sparing normal cells, at least that's the hope in treatment. But if pediatric cancers don't have a lot of these targetable mutations or they don't have a lot of mutations to start with and so they don't have a lot of mutations we can target, then what can we do? Can we utilize those approaches that are up and coming in cancer therapy right now? Um, it turns out that not so much because in many tumors, in many pediatric tumors, if we look at the DNA of those tumors, uh, then we don't see anything that we could target in the clinic. And so our hypothesis was that, um, you know, in addition to looking at the DNA, which is important, we know, can we look at uh, the RNA, which is um, the readout of these genes? Uh, so just for those of you who may not be familiar, um, we have genes that you could say are specific sets of instructions in the DNA of cells. And then those instructions can be executed into actual functions in the cell and the execution of those instructions. There is a step called transcription where RNA is transcribed indicating which genes are turned on and which genes are turned off at any given time by any given cell. And so we hypothesize that abnormalities and how these genes are turned on and off, abnormalities at the RNA level uh, contribute to pediatric cancers and moreover could be targeted by, by therapies. Um, and so as part of our work, we build uh, technologies and computational approaches for how we can detect these abnormally expressed genes, abnormally turned on genes where we have um, you know, abnormal amount of a gene product in a cancer cell. And we think that this is cancer specific and we think that this is driving the cancer and therefore by inhibiting that, um, that product, we could help the patient. Um, it is challenging. So where comparative genomics fits in into this, uh, it is more challenging to identify things that are abnormally turned on uh, 
as compared to mutation. You know, a mutation is a spelling mistake. So you look at the DNA and then you look at the, what we call reference sequence, kind of the normal sequence, and you can see the difference immediately. You know, you can see an A changing to a T or something like that. So you can see it more, uh, more readily. But if we're talking about abnormalities in the amount of a gene product, um, then it's not so easy to do because we have to have a comparison of what should be normally turned on in a cell. Uh, Sherry mentioned that many of the pediatric tumors are developmental diseases, which means that the tissues from which they develop are not really present anymore in the body, right? They were present sometime in the development, they're transient tissues, and they're no longer maybe present in the body. Uh, we often don't know what the tissue of origin is for some of these uh, tumors. And so we couldn't, if, even if we wanted to, we couldn't really pick out the normal cell to compare our tumor to. And so in Treehouse, we built this comparative uh, genomics approach where we take one tumor and then we compare it to thousands of other tumors with the idea that if in this one tumor, we see something that's much higher than what we see in thousands of other cancers. And no matter what the cancers are, you know, we look at all pediatric cancers, we include adult cancers as well, then maybe we can spot those uniquely overexpressed genes, we call them outlier genes, that may be driving the cancer in that child. And so this is a computational approach that utilizes data from all cancers, you know, thousands of cancers, and compares each child's cancer to that large data set we have to identify these potential druggable targets. Thank you so much, Elena. Before we get into some specifics um, and particularly sort of telling the audience about an example, for instance, of, of a case that we've worked on, I wanted to give a chance um, to talk to Yvonne a little bit here too. Um, Yvonne, Elena was just describing, you know, the, the theory behind Treehouse, um, which obviously is computational um but deeply integrated in the work that hospitals do you learned about it as an undergrad i'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about what inspired you to do this work and your own journey um, to being a graduate student at ucsc working directly on these cases um yeah thank you isabel for that intro um so I'm currently a first year graduate student with the Vasky lab. However, um, as Isabel mentioned, my involvement with the lab really began about uh, four years ago uh, during my undergrad when I was a senior here at UCSC. Um, and I met Olena and she gave me the opportunity to work with the Treehouse team and their efforts um, with pediatric cancer research. And this was really one of my first exposures to um, the realities of pediatric cancer and just how many children are affected by this. Um, and Elena already kind of went over the analysis that the team does um, in the lab. And um, when the lab does this analysis for, for patients um, uh, from, with their clinical partners, um, at the end, we have what's called a, a tumor board where we present our analysis to these clinicians and um, kind of just see how these approaches can be applied for that particular uh, child's tumor. And I remember during one of my first meetings that I attended as a new member of the lab, the team was actually reviewing um, a recent patient sample they had received. Um, and the patient, like many of the patients we get was a young child whose tumor had been unresponsive to standard care treatments. And um, like many of these children, there really were no more treatment options available or hope for a cure. And that's really why they were kind of, um, they came to our lab for this analysis. And for me, being an undergrad, like during these meetings, it was, um, you know, quite devastating uh, to realize that, you know, I wasn't just hearing these members talk about a hypo hypothetical patient. We were talking about a real patient out there, a real child with cancer um, and no hope of really getting better, you know, ran out of treatment options. And yet at the same time, um, for me, there was this awareness of the importance of the lab's work. And this was really the first time that like I understood um, how the lab's work was really impacting patients directly. Um, so as I mentioned already, and Elena mentioned, you know, the lab takes these patients cases where, 
um, there's really no more treatment options. Or for many cases, these treatment options are much too toxic um, for these children. And, and so now by looking at these patients from a different perspective, um, from a genomics perspective, really, um, we might be able to shed some light on how the tumor is behaving and identify some alternative treatment options that may have not been considered. And I remember being in awe of the impact uh, that the lab's work was having on patients and what it meant to provide these families with a second hope. And like I mentioned, that was during my undergrad. And as I became more involved in the lab, another impactful moment for me was working on a project studying a rare type of cancer called synovial sarcoma and having the opportunity to speak with a family who had been impacted by this cancer. Um, and this family um, runs a nonprofit organization called the Live for Others Foundation, dedicated to finding a cure for synovial sarcoma and other rare pediatric cancers. And really the reason why this foundation was started was because this family's son had been diagnosed with synovial sarcoma as a teenager. And during his battle with the cancer, he became a cancer activist and started this foundation. Um, and unfortunately, after his six year battle with synovial sarcoma, he passed away. Um, however, his parents continued to run the Lift Brothers Foundation and strive to continue um, their son's mission of finding a cure for synovial sarcoma. And um, this family actually funded a lot of my research that I did on that project during my undergrad. And for me, speaking with this family was really a unique experience. Um, sometimes in research, it's easy to get detached from the impact of your work. However, speaking with this family and hearing firsthand what research is needed by the very patients affected by this cancer um, really left me with the motivation to be the person to advocate for them and to do the research uh, that they needed. And overall, my experience with the Treehouse team introduced me to some of the most inspiring and strongest people I've met and really motivated me to continue to search for a cure for pediatric cancer. And that's really why, um, as I, as I kind of over the years was involved with the lab, I just realized that this was really the work I wanted to do um, for like years to come. And so right now I'm continuing my graduate studies, um, studying synovial sarcoma in particular, and hoping to use genomics uh, to better understand this cancer and identify more treatment options. Thank you, Yvonne. We're all very lucky to have you here. Um, Sherry, I'm wondering if you can tell the audience about what molecular tumor boards look like, you know, the intersection between the analysis that we do and your work as a clinician considering treatment options for patients. Sure. So, you know, as we sort through, as we see these patients who maybe have exhausted most of the options or we have very few options left. Um, we uh, have put together a pilot study where we um, send a biopsy of their tumor to the team at, at uh, UC Santa Cruz and then they do their analysis and then we meet as a group and we talk through what the findings were um, what the team, the scientific team thinks that means about what's disrupted in the tumor, which pathways are affected, which drugs may be effective in that particular patient. And then the physicians that are there talk about where the patient is in their journey and what other therapy options there may be. And, uh, for those of us who take care of these patients, that ends up being a very valuable forum in which to discuss this information because we always have to weigh the options that are available off the shelf and um, options that may have some data to support them. And then we also have to judge this new information, which which is exciting in some cases and com very compelling in some cases, but uh, weighing that information in the context of what other options the patient may have can sometimes be very challenging. And so we really need to understand uh, the data. We need to understand the scientist's perspective on how uh, relevant this information is for this particular patient. 
um, and how we should integrate that information. We also look to our colleagues around the table to say, do you think it's reasonable to try this therapy in this patient in this particular situation? Is it appropriate? Um, because we, you know, we're always trying to push the boundaries of our knowledge, but we want to be sure that we're doing that in an ethical manner and in, in a way that is um, not taking inappropriate risks. Um, so we also, in that forum, have uh, genetic counselors, we have trainees um, of various kinds, and I think it's a great forum uh, for really thinking through how do you prioritize therapies for these very complex patients for whom you're trying to ensure a good quality of life in a setting where you may not have a cure, um, but you want to give them as much time and as much good quality life as you can. So it's, um, it's a very, um, it's, it's a great um, experience to be in that environment where everybody around the table brings their expertise and their uh, talents to, to bear on this one child's uh, experience. Um, and I have to say, I, um, there have been patients where we have done this analysis and the analysis has not yielded information that's been that compelling. And, and I have seen this team go to the ends of the earth to try to see if there's something else they can do <laughs> to figure out something to help these kids, which I think um, is, is really, um, it's, it's great for those of us who do this work uh, to feel the hope that comes from the scientists going back to the lab and saying, is there anything else we can find? Because we do sometimes feel uh, very alone on those front lines, having so little to offer these patients. So, um, so I think it's a, it's a great forum for that collaboration. Thanks. We, we have a question here, by the way, about um, biobanking. Um, and actually, the exact question is, were you able to test with a variety of sample types, including bank samples? I'm wondering if you can explain to the audience how that works. That's to Sherry. <laughs> um, in terms of biobanking? Yeah, just explain it a little bit since we have a question about it. Yeah. So. You know, we try our best with all of our patients to bank tissue um, that we don't need for diagnostic purposes. So when a surgery is done, we take ideally whatever tissue is remaining and we put that in the freezer so that we can uh, use it to uh, learn something about the patient. Um, about the patient's disease. Obviously that requires consent. So we uh, have a family fill out a consent form allowing us to do that research on the child's tissue. Um, this study, uh, because of the nature of the research required fresh tissue um, or um, very well preserved frozen tissue in, in a few cases, um, to do the analysis. And that requires sort of special um, care to ensure that the tissue is processed in a, in a proper manner. And so we have a whole team of people that work on this process from getting the consent, making sure that the pathology department knows about the case, that the person to pick up the specimen is there at the time that the specimen arrives, that it's handled in a way that doesn't interfere with the patient's treatment because sometimes handling the specimen needs to be done a certain way. And then getting enough tissue and, and processing it in a way that, that uh, keeps its integrity high so that it can be used for this, this kind of um, looking for uh, personalized treatments uh, for these patients is done. And then we have a, a research associate who then processes that specimen and sends it out for the testing. The data then goes to this team for analysis and all of this has to be sort of orchestrated and coordinated and done in a, in a time frame that's pretty short uh, in order to be useful for the patients. So it requires a lot of um, integration. But we do um, bank as much of the tissue as we can, um, and we often go back to that at times when we need additional information uh, 
we may discover something in this analysis and we need to go back to the tissue to confirm that, some, that something is present in a, in a uh, certified manner. Uh, so we, we do uh, keep the tumor uh, as much as possible so that we can do further research. Thanks for that explanation. Yvonne, I'm wondering if um, you can tell the audience a little bit about what happens when the sample comes to UCSC and the analysis process. Um, we know that the team works incredibly quickly to return results. Can you describe that process a little bit? Uh, yeah. Um, so when a clinical partner such as Stanford has a patient and they have some tissue available, um, what will happen is that that will actually get sent to a different partner where they will extract RNA and sequence that and generate RNA sequencing data. And it's then that data that um, gets sent to our team really. And that's really what we're working with. So not directly the patient sample, but the data that is generated from that sample. And um, our lab has actually generated a, um, a pipeline uh, for our RNA seq comparative RNA seq analysis, um, which is published and publicly available. And so what will happen is that the RNA sequencing data from this single patient's tumor um, will go through this analysis where it is compared to our treehouse compendium that Elena alluded to earlier, which consists of over 12,000 um, uh, 12, uh, tumors that have RNA seq data. Um, uh, and these include both adult and pediatric uh, tumors. And so from this analysis, really what will be doing what is um, happening is that we are comparing the expression of genes in the patient's tumor against this compendium to see how um, the patient's gene expression compares. And through this, we um, mostly focus on identifying genes that appear to be more highly expressed in the patient's tumor compared to the compendium. And that's what we call um, outlier genes or up outlier genes. And it's these genes that we um, kind of hypothesize can, um, can be targeted with available therapies and may, um, may serve as treatments for these patients. And so basically identifying these um, outlier genes and pathways and kind of part matching them with already available treatments. And then going to these tumor boards and presenting these results to clinicians with these potential therapies that might work for that particular patient based off our analysis. Thank you. So the work that is being done is really important and has already had an impact. And we've had, you know, a few children in particular, you know, where treatment options have been identified and clinicians have been able to act on some of that information. I'm wondering, Elena, we focused this talk really on the opportunity presented to start a diagnostic testing lab um, for genomics, for pediatric genomics at UCSC. And I'm wondering if you can explain to the audience why that would be game changing. What is different between what we do now and what would happen if we had a diagnostic lab that could test in pediatric genomics? and how that could impact both your work and obviously um, the clinical work that's happening at the hospitals. Sure, um, so right now the framework that Yvonne has described is a research framework. And so what that means is, you know, we're conducting this as part of a research study. Uh, Sherry mentioned we have um, this pilot study at Stanford, where the goal was to evaluate, um, you know, whether this research analysis that we are describing, you know, number one, could even be done um, in a timely manner that could be useful to the clinicians. Number two, you know, could we find things that could be potentially useful? Like, could we find these overexpression outliers that could be relevant? Uh, and you know, number three is, could this be effective? But really. You know, with the research assay, we're very limited um, with the third question about effectiveness. Um, so so why, why is that? So what does that mean to be a research test versus a clinical test? Uh, so clinical tests usually um, have to be performed by a clinical laboratory. There have to be special licensed personnel, you know, as Isabel uh, mentioned, there has to be special validation process that those tests 
go through to ensure uh, you know, rigor and accuracy and precision and, and reproducibility of that test. And then the results have to be signed out by a licensed person again. And then once a clinical report is generated, that becomes part of a patient's medical record. And that's an official document that clinicians then can use to, um, in, in their care. Whereas, you know, the goal of research is to derive new knowledge. And so research is something that, uh, you know, is changing and is improving as we learn more. Um, and so, you know, we've been working at this boundary. We want to utilize these comparative genomic approaches, which we believe are useful uh, and we believe conceptually are very important to do because it's very important to look at the individual patient's tumor and see what is driving that particular person's tumor. Um, you know, many of these are rare tumors where we don't have anything similar. And so we really need to look individually at every case um, and compare it to other cases. And so there, we've always had this battle between you know, this research approach. So, so applying something really cutting edge, uh, but then also wanting to make clinical decisions based on, on this analysis. And so we've been, you know, you know, walking this fine line between research and clinical care. And it's been very challenging for clinicians, I think, to act on these results because every time they have to look at this as a research result, and see you know, what other evidence could there be to support this particular direction. So long story short, I think if this was a clinical test, I think it would make Sherry's job probably much easier because then you know, we have a clinical report that's an official document and you know, uh, we could go ahead and just use that and becomes part of patient's record. We could do this on every case then, right? Because it, if it becomes a clinical report, it could hopefully eventually become a standard thing that we do on all patients. We don't have to recruit patients on a, on a study like we do here. You know, we have to recruit patients on a, on a research study. Um, and so there is many, many benefits to having this as a clinical test. It would be, in, you know, number one, it will be more accessible to hopefully all patients. Uh, and it would just make this whole process very straightforward. And then in terms of evaluating efficacy, um, you know, if we had this as a clinical test, we could um, say that everybody who has a clinical report and showing a specific uh, abnormality, uh, then we could run, we could run a, a real clinical trial where we could um, evaluate the consequences of treating based on these types of abnormality in a formalized clinical trial framework and evaluate how many patients responded, how many patients did not respond, and so on. With a research assay, um, you know, clinicians are not obligated to act on these findings because these are research findings. And so it's hard for us to evaluate the full effectiveness of this approach. So that's another uh, reason. Hope that made sense. Absolutely. Um, yeah, Sherry, would love to hear from you. And I, I will say I've heard you also talk, Sherry, about how one of the benefits would be that we could run the test on children for children early in a, in a diagnosis, and that that might make quite a difference too. I wonder if you can talk to everybody about that as well. I was going to say, I think one of the challenges that we have is that many hospitals, because these genomic tests are complex, and because they have more adult patients than they do pediatric patients, have designed their panels, their profiles for adult cancers. And so um, in many cases, we struggle to find um, diagnostic panels that are really appropriately focused for pediatric cancer. And we sometimes have to, depending on what we think we're gonna find, we, we send samples to all sorts of different places. Even though we have our own in-house uh, DNA panel, we do send tissue out for lots of different other kinds of testing. So I think one of the things that is that would be really transformational about having a diagnostic lab at 
uh, UC Santa Cruz that focuses on pediatric cancer is that you could have a really specialized uh, service that that suits all of pediatric cancer. Um, because we spend an awful lot of time spinning our wheels, sending things all over the place to try to get all the information that we need um, because things aren't optimized for pediatrics. Um, and obviously that that goes for DNA testing, but also uh, this newer technology of RNA testing. Um, and, you know, in a research setting, um, it's true that we have to be very careful about how we interpret results and how we consent families for the use of, of that result because it's, it's not a result that is certified to be accurate according to the guidelines that we use to treat patients normally. Um, that said, I think when your child has uh, a disease that your doctor tells you can't be cured with the standard therapies, you're, you are often willing to try things that are a little bit further afield from the standard. Um, but my, my hope would be that at some point, um, if, a, if a standardized test can be developed, that will make it much quicker and easier for us to get the information in um, what we call a CLIA certified manner or a sort of an officially sanctioned test that we can then say to our patients, you know, this has been validated, it's, um, it's been tested to be sure that it's accurate and appropriate for use, and we can really depend on it um, as much as, as we trust everything that comes out of, of the lab there. Um, having that official stamp of certification is important for the patients. Um, as far as having that information earlier in the treatment, I think one of the things that we that we struggle with a lot is that for patients, we often have standard therapies for newly diagnosed patients, but when recurrences occur, uh, many of the options are not great um, or they may be very burdensome and people may want less toxic therapies to choose from. And so having some information from that initial diagnostic specimen can sometimes be very useful because it, it increases the number of different options you have. I think the other setting in which um, we often think about using things that are sort of investigational and, and, our, and our patients and our fa their families are pushing us toward this is that we have patients with very high risk disease where we give them the standard treatment and they say to us, I know that the therapy you just gave us is, you know, the odds are against us. Can you give us something else as a maintenance treatment to kind of hopefully help our child and prevent this disease from coming back? And the data on that is limited yet, but it's really hard to say no to that. It makes sense, right? You've given the best therapy you can, and if you can find a safe therapy, and even better, one that maybe targets something that's abnormal in their cancer um, with the appropriate informed consent of the parents and the child, understanding what they're getting into, um, it would be great to have direction as to what's the, what's the therapy that's the most likely to be beneficial. Um, if, if they're going to take a pill for another six months or a year, um, and if that if you had to pick something off the shelf, you'd like to pick the right thing. And I think having a test like this would be great because then you would have a validated test that you could depend on um, that you could then say to the family, you know, yeah, we can, we can give you this drug for six months, a year, and hopefully that's gonna help your child. Um, obviously we're trying to learn how to do this and we're actively, <laughs> collaborating on uh, a, a proposal to study how to do this, how to move this technology into the, to the upfront therapy of these patients, because we, we have many patients who ask us for things like this, and you'd like to be able to study that. So we are working together as well to try to, to do the research to prove that this, uh, that this works. Um, but I think having a, a validated test helps you along that journey. Thank you.
Elena, we've had a lot of questions about sequencing, um, a few sort of interconnected ones. And I think sort of the, you know, two big themes, maybe if you can describe a little bit more uh, what type of sequencing is done. And then um, there's a question that says, can you give an example of how the findings of an overexpressed gene suggest a particular treatment option? So really, you know, how that sequencing information is used. Um, and then finally on the sequencing front, there's an interesting question about sharing the information. And maybe you can talk a little bit about the ethos around sharing that Treehouse has and the Genomics Institute has. Absolutely. Um, so let me talk about the sequencing we do first. Um, it ties into the CLIA question a little bit. Um, so, you know, we've talked about uh, DNA mutations and I mentioned that pediatric tumors don't have a lot of DNA mutations or many of the tumors don't. Um, a lot of standard kind of clinical sequencing tests um, do sequence the DNA. So there are DNA based tests. There are what, what is called often a gene panel where a selection of genes is sequenced uh, both, you know, sometimes only in the tumor sometimes in the tumor and in the normal tissue, for example, blood from the patient or saliva from the patient. Um, uh, for example, one company, Foundation Medicine, they do only tumor sequencing where they do this gene panel uh, DNA analysis. There are other companies that do both DNA and matched normal tissue. The goal of these clinical tests is often to identify mutations in the DNA that could be linked to therapies. Um, now, in terms of, I know somebody was asking about the coverage um, that is required. So a very technical question of how much sequencing data is needed. Uh, so usually for these gene panels, the coverage is quite high. They can do 100x and more uh, because it's only a selection of genes. Um, whole genome sequencing where you sequence the whole uh, genome is typically not done in the clinic. Uh, so that's done more on the research setting because that is a much more expensive endeavor to sequence the whole genome. But also more importantly, um, on the clinical side, we wouldn't necessarily know what to do with that information. Uh, you know, there is a selection of genes we know, uh, we know could be mutated and we know how to target them. And those are the genes that are typically sequenced by these clinical tests. Um, so what we are doing is different. We are sequencing the RNA actually, so not the DNA, but the RNA from tumors. And this is another reason, you know, we've been, uh, it, it will be um, completely uh, transformational for us to have a validated test because there isn't that many clinical tests that do RNA sequencing. In fact, there's maybe one, <laughs> three, one or two that we, we, we know of. And so, um, and so that's why we've, we, we had this challenge of how to validate this and how to make it into the clinical tests because there isn't comparable um, tests available. And so now it's very exciting that we um, have a path forward on how, how to do this um, with uh, some guidance from our CLIA lab that we have on campus, the, the Student Health uh, Clinical Laboratory and, uh, and, and their leadership there, uh, which is very exciting. Um, so that's the question about sequencing. So we're doing RNA sequencing from the tumor uh, we're also leveraging the DNA panel information, which many of these patients get. For example, Stanford does do foundation medicine testing on their patients. They also do the STAMP panel, which is an in-house Stanford DNA panel, uh, which we also, so we leverage that information in, in our analysis as well. But in addition, in this research setting right now, and hopefully in the clinical setting, we're also doing RNA sequencing and complementing the DNA information with the RNA. For those asking very technical questions, so we're aiming for 50 million reads from the RNA, from the tumor RNA, and we're doing whole transcriptome sequencing. Uh, so, that, uh, so then the second question was an example of how an overexpressed gene was useful. Um, I, I don't know, maybe uh, Sherry, uh, maybe we could do this, you know, Sherry could tell us the clinical story of the patient and I could say what we found. <laughs> we could do the tumor born type. That would be terrific, Sherry. Sure. And we'll come back to the sharing <laughs> of sequences afterwards. Uh, this is my favorite patient to talk about because um, 
you know, in the work we do, we are always faced with big challenges. And this one was a big challenge. Um, this was a little boy who was, I think, 20 months old when he was initially diagnosed with a cancer involving the liver. It was, it was a tumor called myoepithelial carcinoma, which had only been described uh, within the last 10 years or so, I believe. Very, very, very rare sarcoma. I do rare sarcoma for a living, and I've seen only a small handful myself. There will never be a clinical trial for this entity because it is too rare, um, and there's very little known about it. There are no tumor models of this cancer. There are no, uh, there's, there's very little information. So uh, this child had undergone, uh, he had a tumor in his liver. We did uh, initially give him chemotherapy to try to shrink it, which it did shrink a bit. We took it out, uh, the, liver, the liver tumor. We removed the liver tumor and he was fine for a period of time. But as unfortunately often happens, he developed a recurrence of his uh, cancer in the lungs. And our initial approach was to take them, those lung nodules out and hope that he didn't get more lung nodules. But as unfortunately often happens, they grew back relatively quickly. And so at the time that we did the initial surgery to remove the nodules from the lungs, I said to the family, you know, I really don't know what the best therapy for your child is going to be. So I offered them enrollment on this study uh, and told them that this was obviously a research test, that we would learn as much as we could about the tumor and perhaps that would yield some important information. And then we would talk about what to do um, if we were able to get some information that would be helpful. Uh, so the family agreed to enrollment on the study um, and we sent the tissue from his uh, lung tumor removal uh, to our partner to have it sequenced and then on to uh, UC Santa Cruz to have it analyzed. You want to pick up the story there? Yes, so we got the RNA sequencing data. So as Yvonne mentioned, the sequencing itself is currently done by a, a third party provider. And then we get the raw RNA sequencing data which enters our, our, our pipelines and uh, you know, behind the scenes, we have a very talented group of bioinformaticians and software engineers that you know do the ma magic with the data, and then so so the analysis is all automated, and then it reaches our data analyst, uh, Jeff Lyle, in this case, who uh, manually reviews uh, the results and tries to come up with a picture, molecular picture for what is going on in this tumor, what is driving the disease given the information that um, clinical team shares with us or what Sherry shared with us, including you know, whatever mutation information we may have available for the case. And then superimposing that with this overexpression information of overexpressed genes and pathways. And so in this particular case, there were two findings of interest. There was overexpression of several receptor tyrosine kinases so these are uh, proteins that sit on the cell surface and initiate these signaling cascades um, that result in cellular proliferation. And they're often you know, players in cancer. So, th so these are not new genes. These are genes that we often see to be involved in, in cancers. We just don't often know which ones in which cancer. And so in this case, we saw over expression of these receptor tyrosine kinases that could be targeted by a drug called pazopinib. Um, and then we also downstream from that saw our expression of several cell cycle gene, uh, genes, including uh, cycling dependent uh, kinase and then cyclin D3. So several genes that control the cell cycle. And again, uh, over expression of these genes results in the cells cycling all the time and you know aggressively growing into cancer. And so at the molecular tumor board that we had with Stanford, we communicated those two things to the Stanford team, you know, that perhaps bazopinib uh, could be of interest here and also ribocyclib. So the drug that targets the cell cycle could be relevant. And so those are the two things we said to, to Sherry's team. So um, pazopinib um, is a drug that I was very familiar with. 
Uh, we use it regularly. It's actually FDA approved for adults with recurrent sarcomas. And knowing that that was a drug that we knew the appropriate dose for had been used a lot in pediatrics, I said, let's try that first. Ribocyclob is a drug that is very new to pediatrics. It's really a drug that was developed for breast cancer. Um, and I think that's how the drug is labeled. I had never used that drug before. Um, it had been tested in children, uh, but it was not yet available in a liquid formulation. And this is a three-year-old, so he couldn't take a pill. So to make a long story short, we tried pazopinib. And unfortunately, after uh, six or eight weeks of pazopinib, the tumors in his lungs had grown. So it clearly was not effective. So I sat down with the family and I said, you know, we have uh, this other uh, in research finding that we could take and we could try this other drug, um, or I can take something off the shelf randomly and that we use for other things and hope that it works for your child. Um, but I don't, you know, there's really very little known about this tumor. And the family said, well, you know, we have nothing to lose. Let's try the ribocyclib because at least there's some rationale for the use of this drug. Uh, that was complicated because there wasn't a liquid formulation that had been FDA approved. So we had to uh, request what's called an IND, which is the Investigational New Drug Application with the FDA to get access to the drug. Fortunately, the drug company agreed to provide the drug for the patient and provided a supporting letter to the FDA to allow us to do this. It took a little bit of paperwork and time and effort, but we eventually got the liquid formulation that is being tested now in children. This is about two years ago that this happened. Um, and we started the drug. And uh, we did some scans after the first couple months of treatment and the lung nodules were the same. So we continued the drug and a few months later the scans were the same and a few months later the scans were the same and as it approached a year of treatment I said to the family you know I think this drug is actually holding this cancer in check and so perhaps it's time to take out what's left in the lungs so we did sent him to surgery he had the rest of the lung nodules removed and afterwards, we sat down and talked, and they, we had a conversation about should we consider continuing this drug for a period of time? And they said, you know, it's not causing him a single side effect. He's doing great. And the drug company was willing to continue providing the drug, so we agreed to continue. So we said, let's continue for another year if he's doing well. And I just saw him about a week ago for cycle number 23 of 24. So we gave him 12 cycles before surgery and 12 cycles after surgery. And he's now just finishing his 23rd cycle. Uh, we did scans uh, two months ago and he has no evidence of disease at this point in time. So he's now, um, I think he's six years old. He's uh, just gonna be starting uh, first grade in the fall. And um, he's living a full and happy life, has no side effects, and just takes this medicine uh, every day. So I think um, this is what you dream about as a physician, finding a drug that's specific, that's non-toxic, and that uh, helps you to, to take a child with an incurable disease to one where you hope that they can be cured. And I think, uh, I don't know yet if he's going to be cured, but he has been, it's been a year since we saw any cancer in his body and he's doing great. So cross fingers, hopefully he's gonna do okay. Um, but I think this experience is sort of proof of principle that if for, especially for these very rare diseases where we will never have a clinical trial for a disease like this. And I never in a million years would have picked ribocyclib out of all of the long list of drugs that are out there. 
uh, I would never have thought to, to choose that drug for this patient. So I think it illustrates the value of this sort of technology where you can um, really personalize medicine for the child um, for one child at a time in a very specific manner. And uh, that has been uh, a real joy. And I, I sent a note to the team last week that the family is excited to meet them because they really obviously are grateful having been told that their child had an incurable disease, um, that he is knockwood right now, free of disease. And uh, they really look forward to meeting the team that uh, made that possible. Thank you, Sherry. Um, that's such a moving story, and I think it's motivated all of us um, to, to keep going because it's hard work. Um, I'm, uh, I'm wondering, too, uh, that story, I believe, is currently being written up, and Yvonne, you're involved in doing that as well. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. I'm currently working on the publication for that. And so we hope that publication will really make a difference because it will be shared with researchers everywhere and they can study this approach. Um, that raises the question, Elena, sort of back to the idea of sharing information. So obviously that's traditional and that's research, um, but can you tell us a little bit about sharing the sequences and how that works? Absolutely. Um, and so because we, our whole process relies on comparison, so we call it comparative genomics, where we compare one patient to thousands of other patients and identify what's unique. Um, you know, it's very important. Data sharing is crucial to our existence because only through data sharing, we can assemble these large data sets that we can then use as reference data sets for every child. And then by adding to these data sets, we are essentially learning from every case because the more data we have in these comparative data sets, uh, the more, that can inform the analysis of each individual um, tumor. And so we are you know, working very hard on promoting data sharing, um, facilitating it, making it possible. Um, it, there, there are a lot of challenges with data sharing. You know, there are technical challenges, computational challenges where for the data to be meaningful, it has to be um, you know, processed similarly uh, so that you can compare apples to apples. Those who are computer scientists in the audience know about batch effects, right? And so we always have to worry about things like that. There are also regulatory challenges. You know, genomic information is potentially identifiable information. And so we have to be careful with sharing that information. And so we, we, we have to always walk the fine line of trying to share as much as possible while protecting um, the patient's privacy and the patient's wishes for, for those data. Uh, what we do practically, so at the Genomics Institute um, as a whole and, and in, in Treehouse, we share, so we work, I mentioned with RNA sequencing data. And so that's a little less, um, <laughs> say less identifiable, but, but it's not the same as germline genome sequences, for example. So we're looking at tumor RNA sequences that are you know tumor specific so they're not necessarily um, found in the germline of the patient and so what the way that we've been tackling this problem is we try to share as much as possible in the form of de-identified information so we definitely don't share any patient um, identifiable information so that's all stri stripped in fact we don't even see that at uc santa cruz because this is a research study and so what Stanford shares with us is all de-identified. So they never share any identifiable, identifiable, identifiable information about the patient. In terms of the data itself, we don't share raw genomic sequences because even though that is RNA, that is still you know, raw genomic information is considered uh, protected information, but we share uh, readouts that other researchers can use. So for example, we can quantify the expression level of each gene and assign a value to it. And then we can share that value freely because um, that's not really, you know, then that's independent of the raw sequence informa information that we use to derive that value. And so that's what we try to share for all of our, of, of all uh, the patients we have is de-identified uh, 
patient information. So such as, for example, disease type, um, disease type that the patient has, for example, age, uh, sex, something like that. And then we share, uh, we call it processed RNA sequencing data. So summaries of the RNA sequencing data that could be useful uh, for other researchers. Yvonne also mentioned that we share all of our bioinformatic tools that we produce. Um, and this is very important because, so say somebody else, another hospital has RNA sequencing data, they cannot share it due to consent issues. As I mentioned, these are private data and this is dependent on the patient consent, but they would like to use our approach. And so what they can do then is they can take our bioinformatic tool process the data the same way that we do, and then their readout will be comparable to our readout, but the readout could be shared because now it's in the summary form and so it does not have that raw information that we worry about sharing. And so that's kind of two ways we, we try to approach this. So we share as much as possible ourselves, and we also enable others to share by sharing the computational tools that then can be taken to the data wherever the data are and so at least the outputs could be shared and combined together so that we can build these large cohorts, which are so important. Thanks, Elena. And then I just want to add that sharing genomic data is, a, is just a core value of UCSE and something we feel very passionately about so that researchers can learn from that information and use it themselves. Um, we have time for, I think, probably two more questions. So I'm going to combine. <laughs> four questions into two. Um, so we have some questions around the overall prevalence of pediatric cancer um, and sort of getting an idea, what is, what is the prevalence, roughly what percentage require non-standard intervention, and then a corollary question associated with that, Sherry, of you know, why are sarcomas more common in children? You know, as an oncologist, I should know the numbers for prevalence and I don't know them off the top of my head to be completely honest. <laughs> Cancer is rare in children. It is rare. Um, but uh, you know, the, the outcomes for childhood cancer have improved dramatically over the last 50 years. And uh, if you look at childhood cancer overall, um, depending on what statistics you look at, between 70 and 80% of, of children are now uh, cured of their cancer. Now, how many of those patients need something more than the initial therapy that was given to them? Uh, a small percentage. Um, and then there are still the patients who, who are not curable despite that, that salvage therapy. So um, it depends where you're sitting as to how much of a problem you see this uh, as being. Um, I, the last Zoom call I was on today was a debrief after the death of one of my patients. So it, uh, for me, it seems like a really big problem. Um, and I think, you know, as a parent, uh, thinking about this as a parent, you know, I think that every parent probably uh, who has a child with cancer um, thinks that this is a big problem. Um, even those whose cancer is cured, uh, we are now learning more and more that these children end up as adults with all sorts of uh, potentially significant long-term problems. So, um, so I think all of us in this field are really focused on how do we not only improve the likelihood of cure, but how do we improve the likelihood of cure without all the long-term side effects that the standard therapies that we have to offer uh, carry. And many of those are just toxins that damage the rest of the body also. So I think what's so appealing about this, this technology is uh, perhaps you can find the Achilles heel in the cancer. And if you can, you can give a drug that is unique to the cancer and doesn't affect the rest of the cells of the body. That's, that would be the, the real ticket to, um, to success. And there are starting to be examples of that uh, now. Yeah. 
Thank you. Welcome back, Rafe. Um, let me just follow up on that last Thanks. question <laughs> really quickly. We're glad to see you and the sound. I can hear it. Um, Sherry, there was the question. There was the question about prevalence of sarcomas in particular for mm. kids versus adults. Um, and then Elena, I think actually, because she's a researcher and has to do this all the time, can talk um, to the numbers on the prevalence. Prevalence yeah. altogether. I'm, I'm, I should be ashamed of myself and I don't tell anybody here at Stanford that I didn't know what the prevalence of childhood cancer <laughs> is. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, sarcomas are about 12 or 13 percent of childhood cancers. So proportionally, it's it's a pretty sizable group of childhood cancers in adults. They're only about one percent or a little bit less than one percent of adult cancers. But obviously, cancer is a lot more common in adults. So um, they're they're a very small minority of adult cancers. Um, but there are certain sarcomas that occur much more often in young people and there are other sarcomas that occur almost exclusively in older people and the, the reasons for that we don't really understand. Um, someday hopefully we will understand why some of these cancers develop and uh, why certain ones are seen predominantly in children uh, and, and we'll, we'll understand that someday but we don't at this moment. Thank you. Lena? Yeah, so on the prevalence, so I actually uh, gave a lecture on this in my human genetics course today. So it's uh, <laughs> one in 300 boys and one in 333 girls. Um, that's the current prevalence. By the time they turn 20, uh, they'll get cancer. So about one in 300, it's slightly more common in boys. And again, I don't think we know why that is. Thank you. This is why you need a team because somebody always knows the right answer, right? Well, many, many, many thanks to our panelists and Rafe, I'm thrilled that you are back online um, and can speak to our audience. So welcome back and thank you everyone. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you very much. And I'm happy to have uh, audio back in time to say thank you to our panel for sharing this so important uh, research. And, and your, the presentation was just fascinating, just fascinating in the way it, it just really illustrates what hard work it is. And, uh, you know, just such an uphill constant uh, uh, battle to make progress in this area. And I, I certainly really appreciate the work that everybody is doing. Um, so uh, with that, uh, we hope that um, people will join us. You will all join us for our next crawl lecture, which is June 16th on a very different topic, which is change point issues and climate controversies. Um, also a pressing matter as this uh, pediatric cancer is a pressing matter. So thank you everybody. And uh, good night all. <laughs>